I was casting around looking for the connection between the two books I'd like to talk to you about today. And basically, it's just because they're two of absolutely rippingly good reads. Great reads, both doing completely different things. Um, so I can't find the connection. Voila, that's really clever of me. Um, American authors and both women authors. Um, I'll start with Ariel Lohan's I Was Anastasia or Anastasia, depending on how Russian we feel today, um, which is not, not at all necessarily. Um, Lohan writes, um, has written many books and normally centres um, her narrative around a true, um, a true event or a true figure, um, present from history. And boy, oh boy, when she goes into the detail, she plunders every resource, as far as I can work out, um, on that story. As you have gathered from the title, I Was Anastasia, um, looks at the story of Anastasia R Romanov. And a kind of, you know, a little warning before you pick this one up, and do pick it up, it's absolutely terrific. Um, don't read the notes first, and allow yourself just to be um, carried along by the narrative, because this is exactly what the author is is asking us to do. And, you know, you trust a writer as good as Lohan to, to be taken along on this journey and to relinquish, um, which is what our, you know, what is a very current thing, relinquish um, uh, proof, facts, um, and, and any sort of, uh, not grounding or evidence, but just um, allow ourselves to look at why we believe what we believe uh, why do we want to believe some of the things we believe? And why are we convinced by by certain things, whether or not, you know, they're true or not? And the story of Anastasia Romanov as being, having survived that dreadful um, execution in 1919, Ekaterinburg. I have to look at my facts. Yes. Um the that that um the possibility of 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 a Romanov is sort of having um been spared or getting getting um away with their life you know it's been a disney film it's been a romanticized sort of trope and it's a great one to have explored and lohan does an extraordinary thing in that um she gives us this story in two threads we open in the 1970s in America, where um, the also true figure Anne Anderson, um, who is a claimant, as she is Anastasia Romanoff, um, is um, needs to get her identity sort of validated by the existing courts, and um, in order to access the the stars, you know, the fortune that had been. Um, put away for any descendants of the Romanov. So there will be other pretenders to this uh, great um, fortune. And um, we're sort of accompanied by, um, the, on this, this part of the story from the 70s, we're working back, accompanied by characters who exist in both, in both storylines, um, a childhood friend and other people who may have known Anastasia. So it's all set up for... Um, the continuity between the two stories. And then we have, and this is told to us in the third person. It's um, what he said about Anne Anderson and we're watching what she does, says, and um, how how this is, how she's, where she's come from. And this story goes back to a, a certain, the point of when she had been fished out of um, a river looking like it had been um, a, a jump in of despair. And then we have the first person narrative of Anastasia, Anastasia in, in um, Russia, and we, we follow the displacement of the, the um, royal family by the Red Army and their subsequent sort of um, home arrest um, and how they were moved further and further until that final um, fateful day in Ekaterinburg. And there is a point at which 
the there's a kind of a schism between not a schism, but there's both these stories arrive at at more at this at the same moment, and you are left to read what the author says about the whole story. It is fabulously written. Even though you're kind of dealing with in Anastasia's story, her first person narrative, you're very charmed by, um, yes, you know, they're wealthy as, as, you know, as, as all, whatever, you know, you, you, unbelievably wealthy and have unbelievably little information or even sort of care about the drudgery and the the difficulty of life outside of their sort of cocooned existence. And this was all part of this kind of their God-given right to be, um, to hold themselves in such high, high regard. And and things happen which uh, break, or break down their defences, but you can't help rooting for for all of them. And, and particularly, and I think this is a kind of a, a world problem we have, these these are the children of, of a regime and they have they are guilty of nothing other than being the children of that regime and that is not a crime, not in anybody's world. So um, very, very interesting that Lohan is able to make us look at the very wealthy and then that schism between the not so wealthy and then the, the, the who is, you know, what makes you responsible for a crime, what is the punishment that should be exacted upon you and how were they being preserved by members of the the Red Army. It's absolutely fascinating and her notes are fascinating as well. So it's a book to to just go in and go on this amazing journey. It's fabulously well plotted. It's an absolute, it's an absolute gem and I loved every, I was enthralled. I actually just couldn't put this down. So I'm hoping it will do the same for you. How could I not wish that for you? The second book I want to talk about is Louise Erdrich, um, her next novel, which is The Mighty Red, and Erdrich, again, American um, Ojibwe um, writer, and several excellent novels to her name. And she always makes me think a little bit like, I know this sounds a bit odd of Virginia Woolf, in that Woolf used to write, you know, a serious novel, and then she kind of I think all novel, all of Wolf's novels are serious, as I think all of Erdrich's are. But she infused more lightness into some of her, uh, like between the acts, which came between two heavier novels, and then would then would settle into something else. And we know that um, Erdrich has written, you know, Pulitzer Prize winners and is a heavily um, lauded writer. This one, The Mighty Red. Oh gosh, it was an absolute, it was an absolute treat, um, and fed a little bit by um, not, I mean, she very often write into the 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 special and specific issues, deprivation, struggles of um, Native American Indians because that's who she is and that is what is important. But in, in this one, you, you feel it's a slightly more mixed that we're really dealing with a kind of economic hardship, no matter who you are, even though we know that um, our main characters do uh, identify as Turtle Mountain um, natives, which is Chippewa or uh, Ojibwe. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I understand all of the, the, the people's tribes and specifics, but that's what I have understood, um, and I am open to being corrected on anything. The No, not on anything, but on that, um, by people who know better than me. But in this one, um, it's a look at um, sufferings and hardship. And like um, Melissa Lukashenko's Eden Glassy, I think she reels us in with this narrative with this story of young Kismet, who is the daughter of Crystal and Martin, who Turtle Mountain, and Kismet is um, the end of high school and has an awful lot going for her. I mean, she's been the kind of the despair of her mother with her, her kind of her goth um, moments and her, you can tell she's obstinate, but what she's had as a model has been resilience and um, frugality and not minding and you know that their little house has, which Crystal has has secured for them, because the husband Martin is super feckless. Like he, there's feckless and there's feckless, and he really seems to hit that one. Actor thinks um, 
you know, gets himself nice things. And he's not an unpleasant person, but um, just kind of very self-absorbed um, and not earning the money. So Crystal is working out on the sugar beet plantations. And that's part of the point of this whole book. But Crystal um, has this um, resilience and this sheer grit. And there's an incredible sort of, it's a coming of age, incredible sort of humour and a kind of, oh, well, this is, this is absolutely crap and I'm going to get on with it type of life. And then things happen. Martin is accused, their, their father, her father is accused of um, running off with the church renovation fund. And this is an absolute horror story for the whole community because God knows they're poor. Um, but to do that was appalling. And Kismet's sort of been shunting between boyfriends, one of whom, Gary, um, sort of somewhere along the line, just thinks Kismet is the best thing that could ever happen to him. And he's a high school jock. He, they've all been on the, the football fields. They're that sort of band of young, young friends. And they're very lovely friendships. I really enjoyed that. These young men were not, um, they were they were lovable. And this is, you know, and sometimes a little bit, they're believable, but they're a bit outrageous. And their friendship is terribly important to the 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 center of this novel. But um, I'm all over the shop, aren't I? This is like trying to unravel, you know, the woolen ball that the cats got into. Um, She's Gary would really like to marry her, and she's also having this relationship with Hugo. He's younger than her, works in the bookshop, and has wild plans for himself. They end up going, off, you know, going off to fracking. So he makes himself a huge amount of money, and then come back and marry Kismet. But Kismet, once she learned that her father had done this dreadful thing, agrees to marry Gary because they're stable, they own land, and they process sugar beet. They grow it, they crop it, and it's sort of on an industrial scale. And this is what we're looking at. We're not just looking at, at why did Kismet agree to marry him? And did she really agree? Or did he take it that she agreed? And how she lets herself be kind of entrained into this. And, she, and then she realises that Gary's got something hanging over him. And we've kind of learned this urge which builds this up very slowly. There's been an event and not just Gary, but other of his friends have been implicated or have been involved. There's something has happened um, down at the river and where I think we get the name the Mighty Red because we're in the Red River Valley. And it's how this all sort of and um, weaves in and out and unfolds in the best possible. The outcomes are glorious and any, you know, books that make you think are, are always wonderful and that don't end where you, you know, happy ever after Lee are, are sometimes very challenging and very good for our, our brains and our expectations. But it, every now and then to get a book that covers as much ground as she does, because it's on the outset, like Lukashenko, you've got this person, this young person and their affair, their affairs, their, the, state of, the state of their heart and their emotions and their feistiness really reels you in. But underneath, um, something else more serious. Now, we, 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 for Lukashenko, it was the, the First Nations, um, the encounter with the settlers and realising that the land was not theirs, that their land had become bought and taken over. And Erdrich is doing something very, very similar in this one, in that we're looking at the way the land had been farmed and the way native people had looked at the land and the, you know, how a weed that feeds you is the one weed you really need to get rid of in order to be able to process sugar beet or to, to have a clean field, because God knows that's what we want. So um, we're, Erdrich is taking on this, this idea of huge farms, clearing land, destroying the 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 earth, um, and by that I mean both the soil and the whole kit and caboodle. Stunning read. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed both. There are ones you go into and you just live in another world and you come out um, going, gosh, I really enjoyed that. And that's what books are for, um, among other things. Um, I'm not going to argue about whether they're just for pleasure or whether we should be gaining insights from them, but I got both from these and I, I always appreciate that. I'm going to shut up now. Um, the liking and subscribing thing is brilliant, so you can do that. Um, otherwise, just, you know, hang about, enjoy this one, and I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>
Thank you.